you know, but this whole tour is a, it's an investment. You know, we're investing back into the business, you know what I mean? So it's like, even if we've got to take an L on the tour, it's fine. We're going to give an experience that like, no, you know, that you go, you go to one of these venues and you buy another $50 ticket for another artist, you're not going to get the same experience as when you came to the show that Joyner did. And these venues, these are like 2,000 cat venues. So most of these venues, you don't got like, you don't got parking for like four buses because right. nobody comes into these venues with four buses, right? It doesn't make financial sense. Right. So you got to, you know, you do simple math, right? You got $20 a ticket, or, or sorry, $50 a ticket. You got 2,000 seats, right? So when you do the math, you're guaranteed, you know, you might walk out of one of these venues, a Live Nation venue or something, you might walk out with 30,000, maybe 50, you know what I mean? So anywhere from 20 and 50, depending on the city, if the cap's a little higher or lower, markets are different, you know what I mean? And so um, to bring one of these on the road you're, you're, with a driver, because you're going to so gotta pay for the bus, you're going to pay for the driver, you're going to pay for the fuel, right? So a, a 34 day tour is about 20,000 just in fuel, right? So, so a day you're spending about $2,000. Right, when you summarize it, right? So if you got, if you got, we got one, two, we got, well, technically three in a semi, right? So we're 6,000 a day on buses, technically, with driver, right? Is that yeah. what buses? And, and what's in each bus? All right, so star bus, so joiner, <laughs> crew bus, and then I've got a management bus. So me and joiner early, what we did is in 2020, when COVID happened, the touring business went down. So me and him went in and started buying up buses. So we, we own all the buses. You bought it while it was low. We bought it while it was low. Yeah, that's yeah. hard. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, so we, we own about five. So y'all rent, rent them out yeah. to other we, people? We even own our own sem uh, trailers too. Okay. So there's a whole other story there, but our trailer hit a bridge in Chicago. They had the measurements wrong on the bridge, so the top of the trailer got shaved off. So we had to go rent another trailer to put on, on here. Jeez. That happened in Chicago. Yeah, it's crazy. That was on this tour? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's recent. Yeah, that just happened, yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, and you don't have a show every day. You have a show today and you have an off day tomorrow, but you still paying the cost, yeah. right? So it, it just doesn't make financial sense. Sometimes we'll bring some of these buses into the venue and um, they won't have parking because they don't have facility for that many, but like an arena has places and docks where you can park the buses. These guys, not every venue does. This, these guys were able to do it, but we had a venue in Toronto and um, we had a um, park like, you know, 10 minutes out, two of the buses. Only one bus could stay out there, you know, because of the permits and roads and shit like that. So there's a lot of logistics with it. Um, and so, so you're talking, you know, a couple thousand on each of the buses, um, and then we got the trailers, you know. So this this trailer right here, this is all our merchandising. So we just put dedicated merch in here. The fir the first tour we were on, look, you see, stacked up, <laughs> stacked up with stuff, you know. And then you you can't carry everything on the tour, so you got to get shipments in. So as we're selling. We're sending shipments to the, the next cities that's coming because we can't carry everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just not enough room, right? And so when we had our first tour, we had a bus, but we put all this stuff in the bays of the bus. So we couldn't even carry that much. You know what I mean? Because, you know, finances were more limited and things like that, you know? Yeah. You know, but this whole tour, is a, it's an investment. You know, we're investing back into the business. You know what I mean? So it's like, even if we got to take an L on the tour, it's fine. We're going to give an experience that, like, no, you know, that you go, you go to one of these venues and you buy another $50 ticket for another artist, you're not gonna get the same experience as when you came to the show that Joyner did. Yeah. That's right? important, man. Like to me, that's a big deal. So I tell a lot of like smaller artists who can't do what y'all are talking yeah. about. Like there's all these like alternative venues that you can use these days that aren't even a main venue. Like if you go to Peer Space or something where it just looks different. And I always say, because you're gonna go on the same stage that these other people are on and if you're not doing something special up there, production costs, costs money, mm -hmm. then it's just gonna feel like another act. But y'all actually have the ability to invest. And I, I love that y'all are cognizant of it. Like, 
literally someone's coming the next day and it, it just feels damn near the same. Yeah. Like, how is what I did special? A lot of people was just coming in, grabbing their bag. How do you keep costs low? Next city. Yeah. So they got a mic, they got a stage. Yeah, you know I mean, they, they, they the basic company. house lights, basic yeah. sound. Yeah, you know I mean, yeah. like that. See, then we got to deal with things like this. You know what I'm saying? Look, 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 you can see it right here. You know what I mean? It's another day, Every man. city, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's something. But look, check, so this semi, right? So these are the video panels we bring in. So we bring in our own walls and stuff, but, so this gets stacked all the way to the back, right? And this shit ends probably where these wheels are, right there. Just in lights alone. Lights, video, we bring in extra sound into the venue. And it goes all the way up. You see that bar right there? Yeah. So that, it, it goes up about a little, a little bit higher than that. We went on a Chris Brown tour. He had one just for fucking clothes. Like his wardrobe. <laughs> and, you know, and, and like dances on stage and all the wardrobes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, that, that, tour, that tour was like 2019. That shit was like a crash course. Because we went into that tour and we was just looking at the whole operation. The whole setup, yeah. It gave us insight on, oh shit. Like if we're going to do it, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah, you know I mean, so this was like our baby step into like getting there. You know what I mean? This was like a baby step into that. So, you know, we start investing into our own stuff just for that reason alone. You know, and we was like, we didn't want to be subject to, oh, we can't do it because finance is going to look. Once, once we had the money, we was like, oh, we got to get what we need so we can build on it. You know what I mean? And set up the foundation. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, man, because you were saying over there, right? Like you were saying, like, for most artists, it's not worth it to do. Do it. So, what was the conversation that you and Jordan had that made y'all be like, "Nah, it's worth it for us to go ahead and make this investment"? Uh, so, I'm I'm a numbers person, right? And I'm more of like, you know, the business swivel on this, right? So, I'm constantly looking at it from a numbers point of view. He, he's looking at it from a creative experience, you know. Obviously, his content's more video driven, so the video is like mandatory. You know what I mean? Um, so, I would say it was more of him decision. You know, because from a numbers view, nobody will say it makes sense. Right. I was like, bro, like, what are we doing? This is crazy, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but he's like, I don't care. I'll take the loss on it, bro. I don't care. The experience has to be A1. The fans have to leave so they come back and they, and they feel they want to see what I'm going to do next. He goes, it's no different than my music videos. They watch one of my videos and then they're like, yo, I can't wait till Joyner drops another joint and we don't know what to expect from him. Right. Yo, he goes, my shows have to be the same way. And so... When he broke it down for me like that, I was like, all right, fuck it. Like, you know, we, we put it this way. We started touring in 2016. We've been reinvesting into it and we're in 2014, in 2024 now. Yeah. So we've been eight years reinvesting into this business to just keep trying to level it up. You know what I mean? And then you're going to hit that, you're going to hit that, you know. The escape that, that velocity. Point, yeah. Where then it's going to be like, okay, now, you know, not, just like anything, bro. You drop content, you drop content, you get dropped and then you get picked up by a label and you know, you drop content, you drop content, you get that one break. You know, the touring business is the same way. You gotta keep investing into it. You know what I mean? There's no shortcuts. It's hard ticket buyers. People coming out, spending their money, it's hard ticket buyers, you know? And they, they're coming out to these shows spending, you know, they're spending a ton of money. Like, it's not just $50 on the ticket. You know what I mean? Like, it's a preparation. How are they gonna get there? The food. You know, spending money, merchandising when they're in there, drinking, um, clothes, whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a whole thing that goes into going to a show. They're going to call off work or they're not going to work that day. You know what I mean? So it's not just a $50 ticket or a $100 ticket. You know what I'm saying? There's a whole, so, you know, um, it's not easy to get people to spend money to want to come out and watch you. That's like one of the hardest things to do. Like people don't even pay for music at this point, right? <laughs> so Dang, you want me to leave my house? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's it's really tough, man. Even with a fan base, it's it's really difficult. What about festivals? Do y'all look at festivals or y'all try to stay aside from it so they can only see you when you man, come that's out? A, that's an interesting one. Um so you know the festivals, what they do is right, they they'll they'll um they'll have the main headliners and they're paying the biggest bag to them. Right. And then everybody else is getting shorted on the bill. And they're just running up the numbers on the short. They know your values more than whatever it is in that market, but they're giving you a low ball offer because you get to headline for, you get to perform with this person on that stage. They're selling you the stage. You know what I'm saying? And so these festivals are set up where, um, you know, you're, you're not making the money you, you really should. 
right? You're gonna make the money once you're that guy and you're like top three on that stage, right? But you know, everyone else ain't really making that. You know what I'm saying? Do you think they mess up the ability to do your own show or do they help? Like maybe you do it one year, then the next year you come back and just do your own show? Um, I, think it's, I think it's like anything. It's like supply, uh, supply and demand, you know? So they, they, they're like, oh, we're going to grab you so you can't perform this market when we come in because you're going to have a radius clause and all that, you know? And we're going to get you on the low and you're going to accept it because we're going to bring all these people out that you can't get in front of because it's more people at this festival because of the headlines. So they're leveraging. They're leveraging the fact that they've got this big festival with thousands of people in it, the big acts, the big stage. You know, the benefits is, the benefits is you're not having to pay for all this, right? So we have to pay for this on our own shit. We go to a festival, this is already there, right? And then we just bring in the staff that's gonna make sure your shit's done right, right? Like, what's a radius clause? What's that? A radius clause, what's that? Uh, but well, like, uh, you can't perform within a certain mile radius of that location. So if it's New York, they'll say you can't perform there for 90 days or something, you know? Um, before or after or whatever it is, you know? So you can't go to that city and perform. So, yeah, so they're just taking like almost like exclusivity for that time frame. Like a non compete. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, you know, it's, um, yeah, so, you know, the festivals is good. You get a lot of exposure and stuff. But then there's a lot of artists that go on these festivals, but when they go try a headline, they can't sell nothing. So they're doing the festival circuit. A lot of artists, they get a trendy record, and then you see them, they're on every festival, and then they try to do their own headline and they can't do it. And it's like you haven't invested into your, your audience long enough. You haven't invested into doing your own shows where people want to see this experience that you can give them. They're not, they're not sold yet. You did the festival circuit and they saw like another 50 acts. You were one of 50. You wasn't one of one on your own show. You were one of 50, right? So it's like, what experience did you, and then what? You're not even headlining that because you were a trendy artist with a, a record that just popped that year. Someone else's headline, and their show is looking crazy. You know, I think they said something about Cardi, like Cardi B, she had like, did some Super Bowl performance. Well, no, it wasn't one Super Bowl, it was uh, Coachella or something. Yeah, yeah it was uh, Coachella and um, something about how she had to invest like oh, crazy like 600K of money or something, it was something. I remember that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and that was like, in why is she doing that? what they were doing. Right, yeah. it's because she invested back into, I'm gonna make this shit look so epic, so every single one of you that are here is gonna say, I need to go to a Cardi show when I pull up in this city by myself. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's the that's the real downside to the festival, right? It's like if you don't care enough to invest to create your own experience, right? You gotta let Coachella roll out, whatever, create it. Yeah. And I think that messes with the young artists like ego. Cause I can imagine, bro, being like a new act, your first time ever performing at like a festival, yeah. 30, 40, 50,000 people. And I can imagine it just like fucks up your mentality moving forward. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, Thinking that's what it is. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what it is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I'll show, uh, let me show you the bus though. So you can, you can see you can see what we're, what the road look like. So what we did was we wrapped the whole shit with Tully and the joiner to get the promotion around it. We were gonna be on the road anyway, right? So we're like, we might as well go ahead and, you know, promote <laughs> promote what we're doing with Tully and, you know, and the project. Is that this we the just first dropped. time y'all did this on the tour? Like wrapped it? Uh, yeah, no, I had it wrapped before, but um, on the tour, yeah. Cause I was, cause I was like, the, the branding is current. This is like yeah. the current tour branding, yeah. We, so we just did this. We just did this for this tour specifically. So to wrap a bus, you know, you're talking about 10,000, roughly, to wrap it, you know, outside of the car. So there's so much miscellaneous cars. You, you rent a trailer, you're spending another three, 4,000 for the month. You know, it's, it just racks up, you know? The driver gets paid a little bit more to pull a trailer. They get paid an extra 50 a day or whatever, you know? So you're paying another 3,000 for the driver for pulling a trailer, you know? You go into a city like New York, you can't even take this in there. So we get to, if we perform in New York, this has to park in like Jersey City or some shit. Then we have to get like a, a pickup truck that will come in and pull this. Pull this in because you, you can't, it's like you need permits and shit to bring stuff in. You can't bring these buses in. They'll let the semi come in, but it's got to come in, load out and leave and then come back. You know, so there's some, there's some, you know, there's logistics that come with the whole thing. Extra cost because now you got to bring that in, right? You got to get the pickup truck and the driver to bring this in when you get there. Um, here, we'll, ju we'll jump on the joint. This is like our house, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's the living room. Um, 
And all the bus have different layouts. These are shells. These are Prevost buses, and all these get built out, you okay. know, specifically. So the crew bus got 12 bunks in it. <laughs> It's like jail. <laughs> is it? Yeah, but this this is like, you know, this is a, this is a little bit more comfortable. Um, go through here. You got like the bathroom. Ah oh, man, this is like a restaurant level <laughs> sink, man. Yeah, so it's a nice bathroom, man. We got uh, two bunks right here. One, two. So I usually travel one, two people with me. You know what I mean? And then I got bedroom. Got studio set up in the back. Why is there a studio in yours? Make music. You make music too? Yeah, make beats and shit, you know? So I went to school for music. Okay. I went to Full Sail in uh, yeah. uh, 2000, uh, 2004. So I graduated from there. So my passion was always to like do music. I just didn't know how, like right. or what my position in music was right. gonna be. So it started with like just making beats and shit like that, you know? And then, um, yeah, and then, um, and it's like, I don't really get that much time to do it because I'm always handling like the business side of it. Right. But it's a good like mental escape just to like be able to make music. Sometimes it should get bad. used, sometimes it don't. Jordan's picked up a few joints and did some <laughs> joints with it, which has been dope. It's been like, that's just like, damn, like that's fire. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, I, I've, I've got to stay focused on really the business side of it, you know? Numbers, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so I got a little setup here if I ever want to make music, sleep, go to the front lounge, handle some business. It's just got to be comfortable on the road as much as possible. You know what I mean? And if you said the first tour, y'all shared the bus, everybody was in the bus. It was nuts, dog. It was crazy. <laughs> so so the, the layout in, in like the crew bus, so this back area would be like a lounge with like a, a sectional couch, right? So you got like a little couch area. Yeah. The entire middle, so like really from like here all the way up to the front, right? You got bunks. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six. And then on the left side, you got one, two, three, <laughs> Four, five, six, and then you got a hallway in the middle. So the left and right is bunks, Jeez. all the way down, and then you've got a, a lounge in the front. So you got a front lounge, the bunks, the back lounge. Man, I bet that bus stink. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't taking you on that bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, so traveling, traveling with the, the crew side is it's tough. It's got its challenges. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so we was, you know, we we used um, um, the crew bus, and so the first tour we went on, um, we only had, um, yo, we didn't even have fucking bunks on the first one. On the first one, we had a back lounge and a front lounge, and we had motherfuckers were sleeping like this, bro, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it had like a fold-out couch, and people were like laying like this across. And they had one person going like this, another one like it was crazy. Yeah, you know I mean, like it was wild. Like in, in the back lounge, it had the sectional like this, so I, I'd sleep on this side. Jordan was sleeping on that side. You know. So like it make you appreciate this, though. You know. What yeah. I'm saying? So yeah. when when we did that so much, he was like, "Bro, we can't do, it. I can't do this shit, bro. Like if we're gonna talk, we can't do." It. So it's, yeah, so as soon as the COVID shit happened, it was like, "Fuck it, let's get our buses, let's go." And don't get me wrong, it's not just get a bus and it's like a car. It's just there. If you don't use these shits, they'll break. There's things like, all right, so look. <laughs> One tire on this bus is $1,200, right? So you got two, four, five, six, seven, you got eight tires. <laughs> so to do a new set of tires on this whole thing, yeah, over, <laughs> yeah. right? All right, then you got airlines that travel from the front of the bus all the way through to the back of the bus. So it's, it's on suspension and airlines. So, you know, if you're on slopes and shit like that. So if an airline breaks, your bus is already starting to tilt. Right. And airlines are just airlines. Like, they, they can break, they can rip, they can, you know what I'm saying? They can split. Like, so, you know, you got a chassis, you know, which is the main Prevost chassis. Um, and there's a bunch of work there with brakes and rotors and all that, right? Um, you, got, um, you got a generator that's on the bus, so a generator, you got like a 20 kilowatt generator that powers this, a generator is about $20,000, right? And then you got a blower on a fan, and so the blower on the fan keeps the generator cool, so if the generator at any point blows or overheats or some shit like that, it's a $20,000 generator, like you're gonna have to just replace, right? Because you didn't take care of it, or over, it overheated or whatever. The generator ties into the ACs, so we got, uh, we got one, on this one we got three, AC zone one, two, and three. So 
So you usually got three to four ACs on the bus. So the generator allows the lights and the AC and televisions and everything to run. You know what I mean? How like, much was the initial investment when you said, hey, we're going to go in and get our own buses? Um, all right, so well, it's such a loaded question because you're not buying them brand new. Okay. Right? You're buying them brand new, it's a few million dollars. Mm-hmm. Right? So the 2024 type shit. All right? All right, check this. This bus right here is a 2001 chassis. Okay, 20 year old. Okay, okay. look at the inside though. It's renovated on the inside. Yeah, like you will never know. Because yeah. it's on an old one chassis, but it's renovated. So these buses, see a lot of artists, what they do is they're like, oh, I want to book a bus. It's going to be new. What's the year? And that's the wrong way to look at a bus. You should never look at a bus like that. Right? Because you can have a new bus and it's not even broken, which means you're going to have problems. And identify the problems. You only identify the problems on the bus as it goes, yeah. as it's on the road. Okay, you might not have a motor problem. You might not have a transmission problem. But that's not the only thing you got to worry about on a bus. If you have an air leak problem, your bus can't move because your bus is going to hit the floor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you're going to have these other issues that you might have not encountered yet. So they always say you should get a bus that's like broken in so you can know what the kinks are in it and you can address them. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, um, you know, this bus specifically, you know, it's an old one, obviously renovated on the inside new. I mean, if you bought it right now, it's maybe like 350. You know, so um, when, when, if we if we ever were to book a bus on the road now, I would never ask what year it is. The first thing I would say is how many miles on it. I want to know how many miles have been put on the bus. So these things can go for a million plus miles. So this bus only has two hundred. Uh, I gotta check. Maybe like two hundred seventy thousand miles. So this is like broken in now, right? right? Yeah. But it's got mad life left it's got 800,000 plus miles depending on how I take care of it yeah. right so it's got a lot of life but it's an 01 <laughs> so it's broken in 270,000 miles and it's only an 01 it's not been uh, it's not had a reman engine it's an original engine in it you know what I mean so it's like it's 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 it's, it's you know it's not been overworked right. you see what I mean but it's been broken un- enough to be used so the first thing I ask is how many miles on the thing um, Cause that's gonna. T- if they told me, oh, the bus got eight hundred thousand miles, I'm like, oh, you just running this thing. Might have issues on the road. That might be the time where fucking the motor goes out or the transmission goes out. The second thing I ask is, when was it last on the road? If it's been sitting for six months because it got out of the shop, I don't want it. It doesn't guarantee me the shit gonna work when it get on the road because you might have some other problems that come up now. Yeah, you know I mean, so I'll be like, did it just come off a tour? Perfect. That's the bus I want because it just came off the tour. I know it's already faced all its issues it's gonna have on the road. Show me the maintenance log. What's the issues you had on the last run? You know what I mean? Because, bro, it's a nightmare. Because what you, you put up a deposit, right? You booked the bus. Now you're on the road. Now you have an issue. Technically, the company's responsible for being able to give you another bus and all that, but these supply and demand, they can't just get a bus. So now what, you gotta book flights? What are you doing, waiting on the company to book your flight? Nah, you got a show, you're gonna probably book it and then ask them to pay you back. Now, what's the chances of them paying you back? (laughs) Right, so it's like you could book a bus thinking you're getting a great deal and just end up screwing yourself into double the amount of money because you're gonna have issues with that bus and now, now you're fighting with that person. There's a lot of shady businesses and shady companies out here, a ton of them, I've dealt with them. The reason I bought a bus is because I had an operator operate my bus and he did shady shit. So I don't fuck with him no more. Because this whole business is dirty. You know what I'm saying? It's a dirty, dirty business. Like, motherfuckers, you, you, take, a, you take a bus somewhere, people take parts out of your shit and throw it onto another bus and switch it out. You'll never know. Jeez. You're not a mechanic. That's crazy, man, because I was just talking about the other day how that industry like artists usually get pointed to record labels in terms of all the the evil or just things that's bad but then obviously we have this live nation thing and you hear okay well there's things on the touring side and now you're talking about something as specific as just who's operating the buses it just sound, sounds like there's so many different list businesses to learn like being an artist manager yeah. right and then there's so many potential bad people that you got to protect yourself from. So, <laughs> listen, the touring side is probably one of the ugliest. Really? Yeah. 
Like the record label stuff, it's like right in your face. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. wearing a suit across the boardroom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they're yeah. telling you to your face. In this business, like you don't you don't know it. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. again, I'm not a mechanic. Right. I don't know if you fucking took some shit out the bus and replaced it with something else and you know what I mean? Like you don't know. Like you don't know until you stop and have a problem with something. And now it's like now you gotta match up serial numbers. Is this the part I bought? But imagine ma- imagine you take your bus into a t- you take your bus into a shop, right? Everything good, right? Imagine th- you got on the back, you got two tires. Or f- oh, sorry, you got two on this side, two on this side, and then you got singles, right? right. What, what are you gonna do? Go look at them and think about how they blew? <laughs> you got no clue. So what, you gotta track the serial number on the tire? You follow what I'm saying? It's like yeah. there's so much little things within the bus business that I had to learn because I bought the buses, then I had to operate or operate them. And then once I saw it wasn't going the way it needed to go, I was like, damn, that's how I got my crash course in it. And it's like, it's cool, I took the L, you know what I mean? Because that's how I learned about it. Yeah. Now I know you ain't gonna get over on me on the road when I have to book 10 buses, because right. we're gonna go do stadiums now. And when a driver saying, oh, this went out. Oh, did it? How'd you know that? You know what I mean? And they start talking their lingo, you know, oh yeah, you know, the transmission's out and the, the motor's doing this. Did you plug it into the ECM? He's like, oh, how does he know what a fucking ECM is? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. can you show me the report? Did you take it into a shop? What shop you take? Mom, no, no, I need to go to a Detroit Diesel. I need the report from them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, I know enough now to know where like a, a, a driver can't get over on me. You know what I mean? And I took, a, I took an L with that before just to, to be able to understand that and learn that so I won't be in that situation. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Right. And so there's a lot of little logistics to this. You know, they were like, oh, the generator don't start. The generator don't start. Oh, look, we're trying it. And we're going to have to get a mechanic out. Oh, you spent $1,000. Oh, he couldn't fix it. We're going to have to get someone else. You know what I mean? Well, why don't it start? When was the last service on it? You know, and we're looking at different shit and I'm learning the shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh. The solenoid, you just gotta replace the solenoid. Look, the shit's not touching. That part's like fucking a couple hundred bucks. You know, and so it's so many, again, we're not mechanics, so we don't know this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know the shit. I'm I'm learning the shit as I go. You know what I mean? I, I I was told my steering is off. Oh, the steering's dragging. You're gonna need a whole new front end. Right, Trev? They were like, you're gonna need a whole new front end, right? Man, your steering is really bad. It's really bad. The steering fluid's good, but this shit is so stiff. So I was like, word. I was like, do me a favor, get the alignment done first. Change these tires up, let's get the alignment done first. He did the alignment. Yo, it's fine now. <laughs> How much did that cost? Yep. Yeah, fucking less than 500 bucks. <laughs> You're talking 60,500 bucks. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we had a tire that blew on the road. So we got a new tire put in. And then we were on the road for five days and the steering just get, kept getting worse. We went and looked at the new tire. The whole tire, the inside thread was flush. Like, it had no thread in it. Right. And we only drove like maybe 1,500 miles maybe. And so it's like, you know, there's a lot of logistics to this business that a lot of people don't understand. And I don't know, you know, not even close to what I need to know. You know what I mean? But it's for, at this point, it's all high level shit, right? I don't need to know everything. I'm not a fucking mechanic, I don't, right? Yeah. But I just need to know enough, or I need to have enough resources. You know, um, my guy, Travis from uh, Major Touring, he's like a good resource. He's he's dope cat, he's got like eight buses. He does a lot of the big tours in the US, you know what I'm saying? If something go wrong, he's the one that was like, yo, Drew, have him turn, turn, turn the wheel all the way to the right and go look at the tire, and then have him do it all the way to the left and go look at the other tire. And I sent him a picture, he goes, yo, the tires is flush. Go get that alignment. He's the one that told me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then I went and did it. He was like, is it good? I was like, yeah, everything perfect now. He's like, I bet. I didn't know to look at that. I'm learning that shit now. Now, whenever that happens, I know. You know what I'm saying? Because of him. You know what I mean? So um, the, the touring business, I'll say, is real important that you just have key people that you can trust that know enough about the business so you can lean on them as shit comes up. Bus breakdown, you need a bus. You know, 
they know, you know, they can get you on a bus. So you got a problem with the bus. They can tell you, hey, diagnose it, do this, do that, do this, to try to help you figure it out. You know, it's a small community too. You know, and what's that, what's that saying? Um, the mechanic, where the mechanic always tries to jiff you. Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. It's just a more expensive, Same bigger thing. version. Mm -hmm. yep. You know what I mean? So y'all gotta rent these things out as soon as y'all get off the tour, basically. Like, is that the goal? Like, to all, uh, always keep the bus? So I had this one leased. I had this one leased for like a year. Um, now I'm using it, um, um, but it's been active. I didn't want to just have it sit yeah. because it would have been worse if I just had it sit. So I ended up leasing it because I wasn't using it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Hey, this is crazy, man. Right here? Yeah. This is uh, the state set for joining. You said a state set? Yeah, state set. Oh, state set. Yeah, okay, yeah. gotcha. That was the, the production. That's his actual state set. And then my, my one was used for the merchandising. We're going to the venue so you can see like kind of like the setup, you know what I mean? So you can see how we how we got this whole thing set up. This lighting truss, this right here, the video, we're bringing this stuff in. Man. So I mean, we talked about the like additional production y'all bring in obviously cuz y'all want a specific experience. Yeah and how much that costs but there's an additional cost to get people to set it up in every city right because yeah. that's like that's not their house all right so look in equipment right now we're probably all right so we're like two hundred thousand just in gear rental um we have mike um who's our production manager who's like pretty much like the glue and the brains of the mm -hmm. operation <laughs> you know what i mean um very important to every day, every setup. It's a lot of work because we're leaving a city at 2 a.m., getting here at 10 a.m., setting up, and then the show starts, and then so doing it the next day, it's like, it's a lot. But he's like the glue. Um, we got um, stagehands at every location. So um, we have uh, our front of house audio, join his audio, we got Mike, um, we got the video, so there's four. And then every city we arrive to, we have about 12 stagehands, 12, 15 stagehands that are helping set it up. And the problem with the stagehands part is like a lot of these people are just like labor, so they don't really know how to set it up. So it requires Mike to guide, hey, I need this and I need that. And everyone's stuff is unique. Like they don't know how to mount and clamp certain shit if they haven't used it before, you know what I mean? So. I mean, some of them are familiar, some of them is not, you know, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a new, it's a new crew every day that we're dealing with because we're not rolling with the crew, you know? I remember, again, on the, on the Chris tour, we went into the arena and they had like fucking 200 stagehands, bro. It was like fucking 200 people, bro, like setting up a show. It was fucking crazy. I was like, damn, you know? But yeah, so we don't have to roll with everybody. You know, we have them here. And then we pay for the labor hours and stuff here with the venue. So it's another cost, yeah. yeah. It's another cost. Um, bring in some of the sound as well. Bring in some of our own sound as well. Um, but you, you, as you can see, it's, it's a big setup. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that video wall alone is crazy. It's crazy. You know? What's the, uh, what's the numbers on the screen for? Is that like where the panels go or something? Or where certain shots go or something? Um, what do you mean? Like the note, like the one, two, three, four, five. Like, is that? What's... I think he's just aligning, like, but yeah, yeah, for the for whatever video he's gonna run. Yeah. Um, so we're running with a crew of like 20 plus right now, and obviously everyone's gonna get paid too, you know. Do you feel like it's a clear, a cl it's clear to see like the value of the investment in this tour already? Like the first show was like, oh man they can see the level up, the fans experience it? I'm, bro, I, 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 this is the, the blindest business you could ever be in. This is, the, this is like the one business that you can't write a formula to. You know what I mean? Like a lot of stuff you're doing, you're doing based off of um, like a feeling or like, you know, this is what I think we should be doing. You know, um, no, if, again, if, if you told a record label, even if they've got your touring rights, I need to do this, they're not giving you the money for it. They're giving you tour support to just get on the road. They ain't giving you the bread to do all this. Because they'll be like, no, it's, it's, um, it's too much and we can't see the ROI on it. You know what I mean? 
they'll do it on the music because they know what the streams and sales and all that's going to equate to for them you know what i mean but they're not doing it like that i, I mean when we when we signed with atlantic in 2016 i think our tour support might have been like 50k i mean that couldn't even cover <laughs> the production <Yeah. laughs> equipment that couldn't even cover a bus yeah. are y'all signed still yeah. now or no yeah. no no we, we we got off the we got off the deal in december of 2018. okay it made any sense huh it made any sense yeah. so most of the big growth that we know today came from indie stuff absolutely yeah. yeah and i mean that again that was a learning lesson too you know we did it and we we learned it wasn't for us we learned it wasn't something we wanted to do and so you know um we wouldn't have known unless we did it. Otherwise, we were constantly like, you know, looking at other big artists going, oh, we ain't got that because we don't got that, right? We ain't got the label, you know what I'm saying? So that's why we haven't been able to get there. You know, we went to the label, so we know, like, that wasn't the reason. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's part of it, you know? You, you got to take some L's in this business, right? Like, not everything's going to be a win. That's why on the touring side, when, we, when I took the L on that, I was like, it's all right. You know what I mean? I learn from it. You know what I mean? I, I'm I, I'm okay with taking a loss as long as we learn from it, and you know, and it's it's part of the growth. You know what I mean? So. So we try to tell our audience: it's only a real L if it stops you. If you move past it and you learn from it, then it just was a <laughs> the learning moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, um, yeah. So front of house right here, they set up right here, and then we got the the merch set up. So I'll, I'll show you that. And another thing is like merchandising, right? So there's this. Um, what is that? There's this stigma that like touring is the way you make your money. Merchandising is the way you make your money. Yeah, right? I definitely hear that a lot. Right? And so it's like I've seen artists go on the tour and like they're not making that much money on merch. Right? Because it's all based on the audience. Right? So if you have uh, what's a, a general merch item? Right? T shirt. T shirt, hat. Hoodie, right? Uh -huh. All right, cool. Now, let's think about let's think about um, an artist, right? That brings out I don't know. Let's say they bring out ten thousand people, right? So, if that audience comes out, and let's just say it's I don't know, ninety percent female. And they're like dressed up. They dress up. They put on their heels and their dresses and, right? They're coming out like a club to show out, right? Right. They're not wearing a hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like they're not wearing a hoodie. Yeah. Or at least not thinking about getting one right now. Yeah. Not, dress, right, so not dressed like that. Your audience don't buy hoodies like yeah. that. They might wear it casually in the house, but they're not really that audience, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so... You know, I think merchandising is really important. Um, you know, the stuff that we're doing fits the demographic of Joiner. You know what I'm saying? Because Joiner's fan base is people that's into hip hop and rap, a lot of backpack rap. You know what I'm saying? And the women that will come to the shows, they wear t-shirts, they wear hoodies, they don't care to dress up like that. You know what I'm saying? Some of them in college. You know what I mean? So this merchandise goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, you know, we could be doing over ten thousand a night in just merch. Just in merch, you know what I mean? Yeah. Every city, so we got 24 stops. You know, you're doing over a quarter million just on merch. And y'all are, how do y'all project the, uh, how much y'all are gonna sell at each stop? Um, every market's different, you know, but we have this app called App Venue that does all the inventory counts on what you have. And then as you're doing the sale, it's, it's pretty much tracking yeah. everything you're selling. So you know what you're running short of, what you have, you know what I mean? So yeah. when you talked about sometimes we got to ship merch ahead to a city that we're going to be to, be at in the future, it's not like at the beginning of the tour, you pick each city, you find out during the tour yeah, yeah, and then decide. Yeah, because he'll be like, yo, we're selling, we're selling a lot of that white T-shirt. And he'll show me the at venue. And we could see, oh, shit, this one's actually selling. All right, yo, listen, this next city, I need you to send me a shipment of the white tees. Don't send me anything else because we're selling the most of that. All right, so we can kind of make real-time adjustments using the app venue app you know on it um and you know so merchandising is a big business for joiner because naturally you know it's um it's uh you know it's what people want from him you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so 
uh, we've invested a bit into it. We've invested into the online store a lot, you know what I mean? Um, and, and then obviously you have the meet and greet side as well, where people like want to meet Joyner and take pictures with him. So you have the meet and greet, which crosses into the merch because they receive autographed items and stuff like that. Right, right. So you've got your show guarantees for, the, for being here. You've got your merchandising revenue. You've got your meet and greet revenue, right? Um, and then you've got, if you're booking any after parties and things like that. So those are like your main income sources. You've got your guarantee revenue. You've got your merchandising. You've got your meet and greet. And then you've got, if you're booking anything outside of that. How much do they all get into the after party vibe? Uh, Join is just not the type of artist that really cares for that stuff. He don't really care to be in the club. And so, I mean, so you know, not. Not, not nothing crazy, but he, I mean, yeah, the inquiries do come. And it's just a matter of how he feels, you know, if he wants to go or not, and depending on the city and yeah. But as, again, I think that's also one of those things as you, as you just continue growing, you know what I mean? That thing was like another purchase. <laughs> you know saying? Yeah. Oh, you got to gamify it basically. Yeah. Just hearing the triggers all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah watching it. Um, and the meet and greet revenues and the merchant revenues, like it's, it's a lot, man. It's good. Like it, that, that could exceed what you're getting paid just to be here for the show. That could, this literally has exceeded on this tour, has it sometimes exceeded what we're getting here. But what we get in here, we're completely investing in, back into the business. Right. All right. You know so it's I mean? that break even costs and then you have, yeah. you know, merch and yeah. whatever. And that helps even fund most of the shit too. Gotcha. You know, because that stuff's not free. We've got to pay for that. Yeah. Look, you saw those boxes. That's yeah. all advanced money that we haven't been paid for. Yeah. So what happens when you finish the tour and you've got fucking 40 boxes left? <laughs> yeah, you're sitting on it. Yeah. So, th so that goes into the merchandising side. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, they try to stock up on this merchandising. So when we started merch, we started buying the merchandising, having it in a warehouse. So you're paying a warehouse cost, a fulfillment cost, right? And... Um, um, we ha might have had like $250,000, $300,000 in product and zero in the bank, right? Because we've got all the money in the product. Yep. And then what we did was we shifted into a print on demand service. So now all the merchandising um, prints on demand when the purchase is made, right? So now we're not holding the inventory in a warehouse when you don't have a warehouse cost, right? We just have a product cost for when it has to get printed and a fulfillment cost for when it goes out but we don't have to hold it, which means the purchase comes in and it's, pro it's your cash flow positive immediately. Right. right. So the only time we're investing in merchandising at this point is when we're doing exclusive merchandising that we can't do on print on demand, but so it's a unique item, and when we're on the road. Gotcha. Right. Outside of that, we look to integrate with services where we can print on demand. Printing skateboards on demand, you know, hats on demand, T-shirts on demand, yeah. backpacks on demand, blankets on demand, right? So we've got a whole product run. And there's sites like Printful, uh, there's uh, Guten. And so these, you have a Shopify website, yep. you just get a Guten plugin. And now you go to the Guten catalog and you can pick everything you want item-wise. You get a designer to design the specs. You put them on your site, order goes through, it goes through the Guten plugin. You didn't have to pay for no inventory. It just printed straight on demand through Google. And in your opinion, it's worth the cost that they take away from handling all those services. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you're going to put it up front and you're going to sit in a warehouse yeah. and you're going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in a You need that for marketing. You need that money to go promote what you're trying to put out. Yeah. Not sitting in a warehouse somewhere nobody knows about it. Yeah. It's interesting to see, like, even at y'all's level where y'all are, it's print on demand is the best option. It just seems like it's about being nimble because a lot of smaller artists are thinking, like, all right, I might do some print on demand just because I can't now, but I'm trying to get to just paying for my own inventory and, and having that type of system. But y'all basically have like, eh, no, we need to, we have so much other things to invest in. Well, you got to think, right? What is the purpose of selling merchandising? What is the whole, if an artist is selling merchandising, the whole purpose of that outside of the obvious, which is making revenue is your brand value, right? It's um, how much are you worth? And what are people willing to actually invest into your brand? Yeah. Why is that important? Because that's gonna dictate your brand deal, right? That's gonna dictate when Nike comes up and says, hey, we're gonna cut you 20 grand to do this or 50 grand to do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you're gonna, um, 
you, you, you know, you're not gonna, um, you're not gonna accept 50 grand from Nike if you know you're doing a couple million on your online store. You're gonna go, what? You want me to do what? For what? No, 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 no. And you want exclusivity? Where like, oh, I can't do another shoe or yeah. apparel brand because I'm doing your shit? Well, first off, if I'm doing two million a year on the store, over five years, so we're 10 million. We're worth 10 million right now, if you want exclusivity, right? And you're gonna want rights to our store, right? Because that's where our traffic go, right? So our starting point is a $10 million conversation if this business is built up to two million a year, our starting point is $10 million because we can do that ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so, cool, now you want what? Exclusivity to the name, likeliness for three years or whatever the time period is. And you, know, and you want him to attend photo shoots and videos and all this other crap you guys need him to do. All right, cool, so that's different. That's the separate cost to what the online stores, that's happening no matter what. <laughs> You see what I mean? So the whole reason you want to invest into your merch is so you can build your value up because when you're going to do the brand partnership, you're, you're essentially saying, hey, this is my value. This is what I bring to the table. You know, and I'm giving this you know, two million a year up. So let's not even worry about it. Let's, let's, just, bu let's just build this up. Yeah. And then when you have the conversation, I'm just going to do the numbers. I'll say, let's just talk about our store. Put Joiner to one side. Talk about the exclusivity on the store and the exclusivity on the products on the store. You know what I mean? What is that? You guys do numbers. You guys are going to do your little valuations. Go ahead and do it. What's no, what number do we land at? All right, great. Now let's talk about what Joyner's getting paid to actually step in and do it. Right? So for me, it's important to build into this business for that reason alone. You know, and we've wanted to work with a brand. You know, we've wanted to work with like an apparel brand that was going to step in. You know, we always use the uh, Nipsey Puma, you know, scenario as like the man, that would be like the ideal situation, you know, like for us to be able to partner with the brand and do that, you know, but again, nothing comes to you in the timing you want, you know, sometimes you got to just wait and it's going to come to you when it's supposed to come. So, you know, for us, it's been a bit of a wait game to get that, you know, and the right brand will find us at the right time, you know, and, you know, by then we would have done the groundwork. And it, the way I see it, at the very least, they never came. You still got a business and, you, and you're winning. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, we've got to be able to survive. It's like you can't bank on a record label for your success, right? You're going to be able to like, survive without that if needed, right? Yeah. And so it's the same thing, you know? It's, we've we, we got to be able to survive without the brand. Like, we've got we to gotta do it no matter what. There's no, there's no, oh, I start making music once I get signed. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you've uh, yeah. you got to do it. So we've we got to do it. It's just part of it. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? How did y'all price y'all's merch? Like, I guess a good way to think about it is like from day one and then how did y'all get to where y'all are now? Yeah, I mean, th there's a pretty standard baseline because there's only so much you can go down on material costs, yeah. you know what I mean? With quality and things like that. You can buy crappy items. Like, you know, we're trying to buy like premium products so they're not like washed down. When we started, the products were a little bit more low quality. And, but as we're like obviously growing and we're like, oh no, it's important that we give someone an item that's, you know, that's gonna last. That's yeah. gonna last you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think um, look, I'll show you. I'll show you something right here. This was like, this is a really good quality hoodie, right? And I don't know where he got it. He might. Let me see. Um. Uh, well, that hoodie <laughs> was actually inspired by this. Um, uh, we don't got it here. It's actually inspired by like this Versace hoodie. <laughs> a word? So the Versace hoodie was like a thousand dollars. You know what I mean? And it, the Versace print was like basically that. You know what I mean? And then we we had a, a place out in Florida that does merchandising, and we had them just create something custom. You know what I mean? And the, and the cost of this wasn't nothing crazy, but we're selling it for like, what, $80, I think? So we did that, you know, that was, that was the, really the, the only custom one. Everything else was print on demand. You can buy some, a lot of these on, on, the, on the website. Got you. Yeah, that's dope that y'all basically treat it like real fashion, where a lot of times they get inspired by what they see out there, and then yeah. they figure out how to make it in-house. Well, we haven't even been able to like really step into that the way we want, because Join is like constantly coming up with stuff, but it really does require like a brand to, step in and help you like put that together yeah. 
because like we're investing in buses, we're investing in the music, like like we're spread thin, like because we're putting money up for so much shit. Mm -hmm. So it's like this is clothing. Yeah. This is a subsidiary of the music. It's like a secondary thing. It's not a you know what I'm saying? And so it's like that's a whole nother business. So we really do need the right brand to step in that's gonna really help us amplify and be a partner yeah. to it. But till then, we're gonna keep experimenting, we're gonna keep doing as much as we can. You know what I mean? Like join a, when you see a, a state tech, all his merchandising he's wearing is custom. He created not now I'm busy like outfits and fucking vests and <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like and so it's like all that could technically be product that we could be selling. Right. You know, but we can't mass manufacture that stuff. We can get it for him, but we can't mass manufacture that, you know what I mean? Because right. it's it's a big it's a big undertaking. Yeah. How's you know? that one been selling so far? It's good. Like, we'll move it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not going to be a problem. It should be all the key things in terms of we can do the sit down next. Yeah, I think we covered it. Yeah. A good amount, right? Yeah. <laughs>